This is about how the structure of the antibody molecule supports its function. On the right are some of the topics that we will cover in detail. What is antibody? It's one of the most important ways that our body fights off infection. Antibody is also called immunoglobulin, or Ig for short. It's a soluble protein that moves around in our bloodstream and is made by B lymphocytes. There are several different types of antibody, IgA, IgE, which is involved in allergy, IgG is the most prevalent form of antibody, and IgM. What we're going to explore here is IgG subtype 1 called IgG1. If we're going to talk about antibody, we need to understand about antigen. Antigen is any foreign substance or microorganism that gets on or into our body and causes our body to respond with an immune response. Antigen is what the antibody specifically recognizes. There are antibodies to thousands of different antigens in our body and the one that responds to a particular antigen we call the cognate antibody. The antibody that, so to speak, knows about this particular antigen. The epitope is the little patch on the surface of the antigen that is recognized by the antibody. And the part of the antibody, which we'll be seeing, that binds to and exactly fits that epitope is called the peritope. The antigen in our particular case is hen egg white lysozyme, which is just a convenient foreign protein to use in the laboratory. Here is a single antibody molecule, IgG1, and you can see that it has three arms. Let's go back to 1960, long before proteins like antibody could be cloned and expressed exactly the way you want. It was around 1960 when Rodney Porter and Al Nisanoff found that they could break the three arms apart using proteolytic enzymes, specifically pepsin and papain. Even after separation, two of the arms could still bind to antigen. These were called the antigen binding fragments, or fragment antigen binding, or FAB for short. These FAB fragments could not easily be crystallized, but the third fragment was easily crystallized, so it was called the crystalline fragment, or FC for short. These studies were done with a mixture of antibodies obtained from blood serum of a rabbit, and the mixture contained many different antibodies that can bind to different antigens. In order to bind to different antigens, the FAB fragments from this mixture had to have different amino acid sequences, and that prevented them from crystallizing easily. In contrast, the FC arm has the same structure for the antibodies of many different specificities. Because it had the same amino acid sequence from all the different specificities, this arm was easy to crystallize. While the FAB arms bind to the antigen, the FC arm binds to receptors on the membranes of defense cells such as macrophages. When antibody binds to bacteria, the FC end signals the macrophages to attack and kill the bacteria. The thin part between the three arms is called the hinge. Its flexibility allows the FAB arms to move around freely to accommodate different distances between antigen epitopes. The interactive version of the tutorial begins with an introduction to the way computers represent molecular structures. This has been superseded by a separate tutorial 
and you'll find a link to that below this video. The antibody molecule is made up of 12 building blocks called immunoglobulin domains. They are similar to each other in some ways, but have some crucial differences as well. In order to understand the structure of immunoglobulin G antibody better, we'll use this schematic diagram. There are two heavy chains, each of which is made up of four immunoglobulin domains represented by the ovals here. There are two light chains, and each of these has only two immunoglobulin domains. Each of the 12 immunoglobulin domains contains one disulfide bond not shown in the schematic. In addition, there are disulfide bonds between the chains, that is, interchain bonds, holding the heavy chain to the light chain and holding the two heavy chains together in the hinge region. Finally, the FC arm of antibody includes carbohydrate in the form of asparagine-linked glycosylation, N-linked glycosylation. This carbohydrate is important for some of the most important functions of antibody, its ability to bind to FC receptors so that macrophages and other immune cells will attack antibody-coated bacteria, and also the ability of antibody to trigger complement activity, another defense mechanism. Furthermore, the carbohydrate prolongs the half-life of antibody in the blood. The two surface patches of the antibody molecule that bind to antigen, that is the antigen epitopes, are found on the tips of the FAB arms of the antibody. These are called the paratopes, shown here in blue. The four immunoglobulin domains that form the paratopes are called the variable domains. Variation in the amino acid sequences of these domains enable them to bind to an extremely wide range of antigen epitopes. The other eight immunoglobulin domains are called the constant domains. These have the same amino acid sequence for all molecules of the same immunoglobulin subclass, regardless of what antigens the antibodies bind to. Now that we are familiar with the parts of this schematic immunoglobulin G, we're better prepared to look at the actual molecular structures. First, we'll look at the structure of a single immunoglobulin domain. Up here at the top tells which view we're looking at and which text at the right you should pay attention to. Now we'll go to view two. Watch as we strip the complete structure down to a single immunoglobulin domain. Let's watch that again. Here we have one of the three arms, an FAB arm. It is made up of four immunoglobulin domains. Here is a single immunoglobulin domain, and we'll look at it in some detail. This is the backbone trace of one immunoglobulin domain. Now we see this one immunoglobulin domain as a solid object. Immunoglobulin domains are made up of beta strands connected by loops shown in white.
The beta strands fit together to form two beta sheets. Notice that the amino terminus, the blue end, and the carboxy terminus, the red end, are on opposite ends of the immunoglobulin domain. This makes it easy to daisy chain immunoglobulin domains into a longer chain. For example, the heavy chain of antibody contains four immunoglobulin domains end to end. There is a single disulfide bond in each immunoglobulin domain. Immunoglobulin is a water-soluble molecule, which means that much of its surface must be covered with polar or charged amino acid side chains shown here in magenta. Now we're going to cut away the front half of the molecule to see the inside. Nearly all water-soluble protein domains have a hydrophobic core, shown here in light gray. The immunoglobulin domain has been described as a bread-and-butter sandwich with a toothpick through the middle. The beta sheets are the two pieces of bread, the hydrophobic core is the butter in the middle, and the toothpick, of course, is the disulfide bond. Here we have an antigen-binding fragment of antibody, FAB, made up of an entire light chain and half of a heavy chain. And these are bound to the protein antigen lysozyme. There are two immunoglobulin domains in the heavy chain fragment seen here, and two in the light chain, so a total of four immunoglobulin domains in the FAB fragment. There is one disulfide bond in each immunoglobulin domain, so a total of four disulfide bonds in the FAB, and lysozyme itself happens to also have four disulfide bonds. Now we're going to get rid of two immunoglobulin domains, the two farthest from lysozyme, leaving just the pair that bind to lysozyme. This pair, called the variable fragment, or FV, makes up the paratope that binds to the lysozyme epitope. The paratope consists of six loops called complementarity determining regions, or CDRs. The light chain contributes three of these CDRs, and the heavy chain the other three. The two CDRs in the middle 
which are called CDR3 in each case, are the most variable and contribute the most to antigen binding specificity. These are the peritope atoms that actually contact the epitope of lysozyme in this particular case. Now we have added the lysozyme atoms that are touching the antibody atoms. So the epitope atoms of lysozyme touching the peritope atoms of the FV fragment of the antibody. Here we see the lysozyme antigen epitope as thickened portions of the lysozyme polypeptide backbone. Now the lysozyme polypeptide backbone is colored by what is called the amino to carboxy rainbow coloring scheme. The amino terminus is blue, the carboxy terminus is red, and intermediate parts follow the spectral colors of the rainbow. The lysozyme epitope is discontinuous. It's made up of five separate segments of the lysozyme polypeptide chain. This is typical of epitopes recognized by antibody, but parenthetically, T lymphocyte epitopes are usually continuous peptide fragments. The lysozyme epitope is also fairly flat and this is common among epitopes of protein antigens. Here again we see the whole FAB on the left with its four immunoglobulin domains and lysozyme on the right, but now we have the peritope and epitope regions colored. Here, looking through a thin backbone trace of the lysozyme antigen, we see the six CDRs that make up the peritope of the FAB antibody. Now, looking through a thin backbone trace of the FAB, we see the discontinuous epitope of the lysozyme antigen. At the outset, here we see the complete intact IgG1 with each of its functional parts colored. At this point, you should be able to recognize and identify what each of these parts does. Now we'll hide the constant region and the hinge, leaving the FAB prime to fragment.
There are four disulfide bonds at this position. Two of them attach the heavy chains to the light chains, and the other two attach the two heavy chains together, holding the whole assembly into one piece. And FAB prime 2 contains eight immunoglobulin domains, each of which contains one disulfide bond. In this case, there is also an additional disulfide bond in each paratope in one of the heavy chain CDRs. So the grand total here is 14 disulfide bonds in this FAB prime 2. Here we see the interchain disulfide bonds, the ones between chains, in some detail. Now that we've looked at the various parts of the molecule, we'll look at the whole structure together. Here we see the two identical heavy chains and the two identical light chains fitting together to make the whole IgG1 molecule. Notice how the glycosylation, the carbohydrate, props the two FC chains apart. Without this propping apart, the FC arm loses much of its ability to bind to FC receptors on macrophages to activate complement, and also when the carbohydrate is missing, the antibody is removed much more quickly from the circulation. Each of the two oligosaccharides is attached to the protein chain with a covalent bond to an asparagine, so these are N-linked glycosylations. This completes our tour of the IgG1 molecule. Below the video is a little quiz to help you see whether you got the main points about antibody structure. And if you take that little online quiz, you'll get feedback immediately on your answers. The online quiz uses multiple choice questions, but you can also download a document with more open-ended questions to provoke discussion that might be useful in a class or discussion setting. This tutorial is by Frieda Reichsman and Eric Martz. The video capture and titling was done by Eric, and I am Eric speaking. You can find this video at molviz.org m-o-l-v-i-z dot org, which also has interactive tutorials that do work on molecules such as DNA and hemoglobin. What you're watching is a video captured from an online interactive tutorial. This is just a video. It is not interactive, so when you see white buttons or blue links, don't try to click them.